Thank you, Billy. Very, very happy to be here. Um, and it's great to see so many familiar faces. Um, so yeah, uh, as Billy said, I'm interested in this idea of shape change in robots, how form informs function and vice versa. Um, so today I want to kind of give you two uh, anecdotes. Uh, one pertains, uh, sort of in the spirit of the last talk, to some multipolar amphibious locomotion, and the other pertains to some recent work um, about sort of multitask robots. Uh, and so how do we get generalist systems, right? Um, so let's get right into it. Um, so first, what the heck does my talk mean? I'm talking about specialized generalists, uh, specialist generalists and generalized specialists. So in, the, in robotics, if we have some parameter space and we have different attributes uh, that a robot's trying to perform, a specialist is something like this, right? It excels at one of these categories at the expense of other things. Um, you know, these could be anything, right? Land speed, water speed, problem solving, dexterity, efficiency, some abstracted uh, attributes here. On the other hand, generalist tends to, to look something like this, right? So we achieve sort of uh, mediocre performance across a number of attributes. And we really sacrifice this, this, this peak performance here. And so I think what we want to reach in uh, robotic is this idea of a generalized specialist. So uh, someone who can occupy this entire area. Um, and obviously, this is a non-trivial challenge, um, right? We're asking these systems to do all sorts of things. Um, but uh, I, I, you know, I think there's a number of ways we can get there. Uh, but the first consideration we have to think about is to, to reach this goal is this idea of a trade-off, right? There seems to be some sort of trade-off between a specialist and a generalist. And often, this is illustrated best in biology. Um, so let's take, for example, this land and water speed attribute, Sarah. So what I'm plotting here is sort of a, a loose notion of water speed and land speed. Um, and I'm plotting a few different animals. So some of you may be familiar with the, the swordfish, sort of an astounding creature moving up to 30 meters a second um, in open water. Um, so obviously very fast in water, but uh, you know if you put the fish on land, it's not going anywhere. Um, you know, on the other side of this coin, we have uh, things like cheetahs, right? Highly specialized and optimized for land locomotion, although you don't see cheetahs uh, swimming around particularly efficiently. And then somewhere in the middle uh, lies classes of animals that are amphibious or, uh, uh, you know, primarily spend time in each different habitat. And so these make compromises in terms of their speed. So this is the, the, the a salamander, which is, you know, not particularly great at either thing. And so in robotics, we see a similar dichotomy, actually. Um, so you know, the fastest underwater fish robot is this uh, Robotuna here, which is moving about one meter per second. Um, on the other hand, we have the MIT cheetah, which is you know, moving pretty quick for a robot on land. And then in between, we have uh, sort of these amphibious robots. And this is a snake-inspired robot here. And so I don't think it's any coincidence that this sort of hierarchy in animals is uh, replicated in robots here. Um, considering that a lot of our uh, inspiration is just a direct body template matching and control scheme matching between each of these animals and the robot template. And so what we have a unique option to do in robotics is uh, depend on these synthetic materials and mechanisms and sort of push this Pareto front um, by controlling our shape and, and gates so that we can maybe stretch this, this graph to achieve a generalized specialist. Um, and so let me give you one example of some work so far I've been doing on, on this front, uh, on the shape control side. Um, and that's with this notion of adaptive morphogenesis. This is the way I like to think about shape change, is the ability for a robot to uh, evolve its form on demand, to sort of specialize to any environment it may encounter. And, and, and so this, this first example here is with an amphibious robotic turtle art. Um, the real innovation here is we're taking these, these legs that simply transform their shape between a streamlined hydrodynamic flipper and a load-bearing uh, leg. And then we can attach these to a quadrupedal robot platform, shown here. So this robot has three degrees of freedom on each shoulders. It can perform sort of a range of loosely bio-inspired uh, gates for water and land. And then by changing the, the shape of the limb and adapting the gates, uh, the robot is able to move through both uh, uh, the water and on the land uh, with reasonable efficiency. And to sort of understand like what, what's actually the benefit we're reaping from the shape change, we looked at, in particular, this robot's 
uh, cost of transport, so some notion of its energetics as it's locomoting. Um, so by looking at the energetic uh, energetics of, of these gates through the power that the robot's expanding uh, by measuring the current, uh, and then we can multiply this uh, by the voltage and get electronic power, normalize this by the robot's mass, gravity, and its forward velocity to calculate this cost of transport. Um, and you know, this, this metric is non-dimensionalized, so we can compare a lot of different robots and animals. Um, what we find is the robot situates itself somewhere in here. Um, and in my eyes, this is a pretty nice success because this robot's performing in the vicinity of, and in some cases actually outperforming robots that are designed for one uh, environment. And this robot's designed to move through multiple. Um, so its efficiency has been increased through this, this power of, of shape change on demand. Now, so this is just one way of thinking about shape change, really. This, this sort of, you have a mechanism in one state, it's like this, and in another state, it's like this. You sort of have this direct control over the, the surface normals or, or the, the metric or the a deformation gradient of your mechanism. Um, and I think that's, that's one, one way to think. Another way to think about shape change, um, and I'd like to challenge you a little bit, I know we'll talk about deformations later, um, is this idea that shape is just relative. Right, so I have I have a, a shape in this coordinate system, and I just look at it a different way. It's a different shape, and I look at it a different way again. Uh, functionally, this shape is changing. Right, if I'm interacting with the environment with this shape versus this shape, they all have different projected geometries. They all have different surface characteristics when viewed from different angles. So I think this is actually an interesting idea we can exploit, and instead of relying on more of this complex mechanism design, we can have a fixed or you know, close to fixed mechanism and actually intelligently vary the gates that our robot is using to uh, uh, sort of reap benefits of shape change effectively. So here's one example of that. Um, so this is a robot I've been working with recently, a quadruped robot animal. Um, and you'll notice his feet are a little bit weird. Um, so what I've done is I've changed out this, this foot that you normally see on quadruped robots, which is just kind of this dumb ball thing uh, for walking around. And I've, uh, and so this ball normally just has sort of this, uh, you know, Hirschian contact distribution with the ground. You know, it can move over uneven terrains. But, you know, once you want to start doing more than just walking, you know, th this shape becomes ineffective. So I've replaced this, this, this ball with sort of this hook with two different contacts. And then suddenly, this relative shape space explodes because not only do we have this, we've eliminated the symmetry of this sphere, we now have the original contact points, we have another contact point up here, and we have this whole functional area that we could maybe use uh, for some task. And so the idea here is um, in simulation with the model of this robot, um, we've begun to explore, okay, what benefits does this particular shape adaptation afford that the robot couldn't previously do? So in this case, you see. Um, this robot's able to traverse r relatively unstructured terrain with a little bit more stability because it has these two contact points it can rely on at certain times. Another thing that it can do is suddenly, by leveraging this hook feature, it can climb ladders. And this is uh, something, you know, the original shank of foot couldn't do at all. Um, and in fact, it can climb a number of different ladders all with the same control policy just by sort of devolving the, the task to this repetitive motion of throwing its hook forward applying tension forces between its shank uh, or its body and the ladder and pulling itself up the ladder. And so we're finding that this sort of subtle modification to the existing foot geometry is unlocking these new things. Um, and you know, as far as like sim to real goes, which the question you might have, uh, we're working on it, um, although we're not quite there yet. Um, and you know, there's, there's still some kinks to work out here. Um, but you know, ultimately, what we found is that, in, indeed, I think you can reap some advantages of shape change without actually changing the mechanism itself, just by changing the coordinate system or the way that it's being used to interact with the environment. And so I think in our quest for the generalized specialist, right, the robot that can achieve all of these tasks with a high level of proficiency, uh, we can consider these two avenues. right? We can consider devising mechanisms that change their shape uh, through some complicated programmatic behavior. But oftentimes, you know, there's, there's some downsides, right? It could be this, the thermal latency. It could be the robustness of the mechanism you're using. It could just be the difficulty of controlling this continuum with many degrees of freedom. On the other hand, we can rely on 
uh, sort of the sophistication inside our robot itself. So rely on gates and how we actually uh, maneuver this appendage or whatever fixed shape we have with our environment. And we can exploit uh, that sort of as an effective shape change. Um, but sort of my research on both these fronts has led me to the conclusion that you know these can't really exist in isolation and reach the generalized specialists. I think these go uh, in tandem. And moving forward, uh, I think this is where some exciting research lies. Um, so yes, I'll wrap up real quick. Thank you to my collaborators who helped me do this work. Um, and yes, I'm open to questions.